Welcome to this presentation. My name is Christine Woodcock, and I'm going to assist you to find your Scottish ancestors who may have emigrated to Canada. From the mid 1600s, Newfoundland offered seasonal work for Irish and English fishermen, thanks mostly to the prolific cod stocks. In the 1700s, Scots merchants took advantage of the established fishing communities in St. John's and the Avalon Peninsula. They emigrated to Newfoundland and they set up shop. These men, primarily from Glasgow and Greenock, were merchants and traders and they offered supplementary services to the fishermen. They were jewelers, watchmakers, and mercantile shop owners. Their success led to professionals emigrating, doctors, lawyers, clergy, and teachers. Few documents survive from the time period, but any that do exist will be available at the Rooms, which is the provincial archives for Newfoundland. During the French and Indian War, the 42nd Regiment of Foot was sent to North America. They were involved with the surrender of Montreal in 1760 and also in the early battles of the American Revolution. The 84th Regiment of Foot was raised in Prince Edward Province of New York from Scottish soldiers who had stayed in America following the Seven Years' War. This then resulted in the 84th Regiment of Foot being one of the oldest regiments with some of the most experienced officers in North America. The 84th Regiment of Foot was key to protecting Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritime Provinces during the Revolutionary War. After the war, soldiers in the Scottish regiments were re who remained loyal to the Crown were granted land in Canada. The land grants were strategically placed all along the St. Lawrence Seaway, much of which borders the United States. This covers a, an area of approximately 288,688 acres. If you think your ancestor was a loyalist, you can look for land grants at Collections Canada, which is the website for Library and Archives Canada, our national archives. The land grants can be searched for Upper Canada, which is now Ontario, and Lower Canada, which is now Quebec. If your ancestor was with the 84th Regiment of Foot, the payroll and muster books have been transcribed and can be found at the University of New Brunswick's website in their Loyalist collection. Britain acquired the island of St. John, later Prince Edward Island, from the French in 1763 as part of the Treaty of Paris. The Crown parceled the land off into 67 lots of approximately 20,000 acres. These lots were granted to 17 friends and supporters of the Crown for their loyalty and dedication to the King. The new landowners were supposed to settle the island and pay quit rents. However, they were notoriously absent as landlords. Between 1770 and 1815, some 15,000 Highland Scots came to Canada. They settled in Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and Upper Canada. The majority of them were Catholic and almost exclusively Gaelic speaking. In fact, Gaelic was the third most common language in Canada at that time. The Board of Trade initiated surveys to allow the British to exploit the region's potential for commerce, particularly fishing. The Board of Trade further recognized the need to mobilize settlers to clear, cultivate, and improve the lands adjacent to the waters. The first land speculator, Lord Advocate Sir James Montgomery, sent out about 60 settlers from Perthshire. That group arrived in 1770. The following group came from Dumfrieshire. And in September of 1770, Robert Stewart and his family arrived with about 60 settler families, amounting to about 200 people from Argyle. This group was then uh, joined by another group that fall who came from Argyle, but they came out on their own account. The largest settlement was organized by Captain John MacDonald of Glenalladale. He had become the eighth Laird of Glenalladale. He was dissatisfied with the situation in Scotland, so he mortgaged his lands to his cousin and he purchased Lot 36 on St. John's Island from the Lord Advocate, Sir James Montgomery. In 1770, Colin MacDonald of Boysdale had begun to pressure Catholic tenants on the island of South Uis to either convert to the Church of Scotland or vacate their property. So with the support of the Roman Catholic Church, John MacDonald gathered a group of 210 settlers, including 110 from the mainland, who departed for St. John's Island in May of 1772. This group became known as the Glendale Settlers, Glenalladale Settlers. 
The PEI Historical Society released a very genealogically comprehensive book on the Glen Allerdale settlers, and you can purchase that at islandregister.com forward slash Glen Allerdale. Tommy Douglas was the seventh son of the fourth Earl of Selkirk. He attended the University of Edinburgh to, to study law. While he was there, he noticed Scottish crofters who had been displaced by their landlords. Seeing their plight, he investigated ways to help find them new land in Canada. Upon the death of his surviving brother, and then the death of his father, Douglas became the first, fifth Earl of Selkirk. With his unexpected inheritance, he used money and political connections to purchase land and settle poor Scottish farmers in Belfast, Prince Edward Island. He brought 400 passengers from Skye, 250 from Mull, 50 passengers from Uist in 1803. In 1806, these families were joined by settlers from Collinsey, Orancey, and Tyree. Each Selkirk settler family was given 200 acres at a subsidized cost. Each farm had access to water. The Highlanders worked together to build their homes, clear the land, and have it ready for settlement. Passenger reconstruction lists for both the Polly and the Dykes can be found on islandregister.com forward slash Selkirk Settlers. Timber suited for the construction of ship masts was on land that belonged to the Crown and was set aside for the use of the Royal Navy. The land was off limits for settlement, but by the mid 1700s, the government changed the policy to allow large land grants to be given to associations and individuals if they agreed to bring in settlers. Clyde merchants began hauling timber from Nova Scotia in the early 1790s. Their trade in oak and pine flourished during the Napoleonic War. In 1806, a stiff terrace was placed on Baltic timber, thus making the timber trade in Canada much more essential. Ships traveling relatively empty to Canada, the shippers decided to advertise for passengers. This then resulted in two-way trade, passengers and settlers on the westward journey and timber on the eastward journey. Fur trader and explorer Simon Fraser personally oversaw the migration of 650 Highland Scots from the Clan Ranald estate to his land at Pictou, Nova Scotia. The settlers were in very poor state when they arrived. In fear that they might move to South Carolina, then Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, John Parr, personally took them under his wing and he paid for their provisions. Scott's recruiting agent, John Ross, advertised for settlers in Scottish newspaper, offering land on easy terms and passage to Canada at three pounds, five shillings per adult. Most who accepted this offer came from Loch Broom. The emigrants were looking to flee from high rents, bad harvests, and they were not particularly poor. Ross offered a year's worth of supplies upon arrival, although those provisions never did materialize. In total, 189 people boarded the Hector from two different points in Scotland, 179 at Loch Broom and another 10 from Greenock. The BBC did a fabulous one hour um, documentary on the Hector, and I would strongly recommend uh, you watching it. The Hector became Canada's Mayflower. The idea was that it was the first ship to bring large groups of people from Scotland, but we can see that there were many large groups of people from Scotland here long before the Hector. If your ancestor was on the Hector, the Records for the Hector Descendants has a website, shiphectordescendants.ca. McCullough House has records, and the passenger list is also at shiphector.ca. In 1799, a contingent of McNeils from Barra arrived in Pictou, eventually settling in Cape Breton. This began a rather large influx of emigrants from Barra, and they are still today affectionately known as the Barra McNeils. Relevant records for researching in Nova Scotia can be found at the Provincial Archives website. The Hudson's Bay Company was a London-based company and it was incorporated in 1670. 
the charter granted sole trade and commerce along Rupert's land. And you can see that's a huge swath of land in Canada. It encompasses what is now Ontario, Manitoba, Southern Saskatchewan, Southern Alberta, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories. The Hudson's Bay Company began recruiting in Orkney in 1702. They appointed local merchant David Geddes to be their recruiting agent. By 1799, three quarters of the men working at York Factory were from Orkney. And in 1800, the HBC began recruiting in uh, uh, Harris and Lewis as well. Men signed on with the HBC to, as a way to be prevented from being press ganged into the Navy. The men were indentured for three to five years. The men were paid anywhere from eight pounds a year to 20 pounds a year, depending on their rank and their experience. Officers, chief traders, clerks were given an additional two pounds for tea and sugar. Men were supplied with housing, food, and clothing. Women were not allowed. So the men coupled with Cree women during their five-year tenure. And the children produced from these relationships gave rise to the Métis Nation in Canada. Young John Fuppister signed a three-year contract with the HBC in Stromness in 1806 to work for eight pounds a year. He sailed aboard the Prince of Wales. He worked at Moose Factory, Fort Albany, and Martin Falls, which is now North Dakota. He was a hard worker. He was a compliant worker. However, when he was out, he took unwell and begged to take shelter with Northwest fur trader Alexander Henry. The Northwest Company, as we'll see shortly, was a rival company to the Hudson's Bay Company. So for him to take shelter with the fur trader from the Northwest Company, he really was not well. He was allowed into the cabin and lay at the hearth. On December the 29th, 1807, he gave birth to a son, revealing that he in fact was a woman by the name of Isabel Gunn. He was relegated to being a washerwoman after his identity was revealed. And because he had played a trick on the Hudson's Bay Company, he was unable to stay after the tenure was up. So he was returned to Stromness, or she was. We can see here in the um, employee contract, this is for John Fubister, uh, also Isabel Gunn says, came out on Prince of Wales to the Mo to Moose Factory, then on to Albany. Traveled to Henley House, Martin Falls, and Pembina. Gave birth to a boy at Pembina in the Northwest Company House. Left for Albany via Martin Falls with Hugh Haney. Then he was relegated to being a washerwoman. Discharged since we cannot think of keeping this woman any longer as she is of bad character and has not answered the intentions for which she was detained. Isabel and her son went home on the Prince of Wales. And we can see from the records at the National Records of Scotland that Isabel died a pauper at the age of 80. Orcadias were specifically recruited to the Hudson's Bay Company to build York boats. These were long, flat-bottomed boats built on a, a Viking design. It made it easy for them to launch or beach off a sandbar. And that made it really handy for working the internal waterways. As well, the York boats could carry three tons of goods at a time, which is about three times what the other boats could carry, making them much more efficient. And although we think of Hudson's Bay being right around the Hudson's Bay, in fact, they were right across Canada. They had posts in Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, the Yukon Territories, and the Northwest Territories. Rival Trading Company, Northwest Company, was founded in 1799 by Highland Scots, who had migrated to Montreal after 1760. Their labor force were French Canadians from the Montreal area. However, the men wintered in Rupert's Land, also coupling with Cree women. They created a strong tie between the Northwest and the St. Lawrence Seaway. By 1811, the Hudson's Bay Company was struggling financially, and they agreed to sell a large portion of land to the Earl of Selkirk. Remember him from Belfast, Prince Edward Island. 
they sold him a landmass five times the size of Scotland at 116,000 square, mile, square miles, and this was all along the Assiniboine River. It included areas which are now North Dakota and northern Minnesota. As part of the agreement of sale, Selkirk settlers were to be indentured to the Hudson's Bay Company for a period of three years, and each settler was granted a 100-acre lot. Relevant records for HBC land tenures can be found on Canadiana online. This is a free website, by the way. However, there were problems with the Northwest Company because the Red River settlement straddled the Northwest Company's trading routes. The Northwest Company forts were on land sold to Selkirk. And by clearing land for settlement, Selkirk disrupted animal habitats, which were vital to the fur trade. This created a rivalry between the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. Remember that the Hudson's Bay Company had been chartered with sole uh, commerce and trade in the region. Not only were there bitter relations between the Northwest Company and the HBC, but there were also bitter relations between Selkirk and the Northwest Company. The Crown was asked to intervene. The Colonial Office, however, wanted peace and harmony and basically told them to figure it out. The partnership of the Northwest Company, the leaders, was due to expire in 1821, so a parliamentary act granted exclusive trade to the Hudson's Bay Company, and the partners of the Northwest Company were then brought into the Hudson's Bay Company, and they were made officers. This allowed the two companies to form a coalition. The name, charter, and privileges of the old Hudson's Bay Company provided a foundation for the future, while the skills and experience of the Northwest Company men strengthened the company and broadened their scope going forward. If you're looking for the court proceedings, those can also be found at Canadiana Online. With the amalgamation the Northwest Com uh, with the Northwest Company, the Hudson's Bay Company extended their territory with outposts into the Pacific Northwest all along the Columbia watershed. The Puget Agricultural Puget Sound Agricultural Company was incorporated in 1839, and it was the first example of corporate farming. It provided beef, grain, lumber, and salted salmon. It was meant to be arm's length from the Hudson's Bay Company, but the officers were also HBC officers. They only purchased their livestock from the HBC. Stock purchases were limited to officers and directors of the HBC. The Puget Sound Agricultural Company had two large farms, one for livestock called Nisqually and one for grain called Cowlitz. This broadened the number of posts for the Hudson's Bay Company as well, taking them into Washington State, Alaska, the Dakotas, California, and Hawaii. <clears throat> Relevant records for Hudson's Bay Company research are on deposit with the Manitoba Archives in Winnipeg, they're digitized and some are available online, although not all of them. You can see worker contracts there. Employment and service records, which is what we saw for uh, Isabel Gunn. This one is for Thomas Ray, who um, it's actually for, for John McPherson Ray. So it says, Thomas Ray requests an appointment as a clerk for his son, John, who he describes as a strong, able, healthy young fellow with a good disposition. He has had all the education that I could procure for him here at Kingston. Since leaving school, he has made some months at a commercial trade in Toronto and has been occupied one winter by me, looking after men getting out square timber in the backwoods. So Thomas Fraser, the company's London secretary, advised Ray of his appointment. He was sent a letter advising William McTavish at Red River of Ray's appointment and future arrival from Hamilton. He signed on at Norway House, which is just outside of uh, York Factory. He worked as an apprentice clerk and he retired as a freeman. British Columbia Archives has records for officers. There's a large photographic collection also at the BC Archives.
The minute books for the Joint Indian Reserve Commission uh, are available at the University of British Columbia's website in their special collections under the Joint Indian Reserve Commission collection. There you'll find minute books for the JIRC, correspondence, reports, and maps. The National Archives in Kew has headquarter records, records concerning posts in North America, logs, books, and papers relating to ships in the service of the company, governor's papers and records from the commissioner's office in Winnipeg, miscellaneous records, which include correspondence and journals of various individuals, as well as records of the Red River Settlement, information about the Vancouver Island Colony, Arctic expeditions, and parliamentary select committees. Records of allied and subsidiary committees or companies, which include the Northwest Company, Puget Sound Agricultural Company, International Finance Society, Russian American Company, and the Assiniboine Wool. It also has uh, records for the Red River Tallow Company, Vancouver Island Steam and Sawmill, the Vancouver Coal Mining Company, and the Buffalo Wool Company. And the HBC employees worked at each of these. There's also a manuscript collection of maps, charts, plans of Hudson's Bay Company forts, coal mines, various American and British territories, and Canadian cities and towns, together with architect drawings, specifications, and atlases. Red River Ancestry has an ancestor index, and it's an alphabetical listing with hyperlinks to information on each person listed. That's also a free website. By 1866, the Crown was in negotiations to have Rupert's land brought back to them so that the land could be included into the Dominion of Canada. The Hudson's Bay Company surrendered Rupert's land to the Canadian government on the 1st of December, 1869. The British Crown officially transferred Rupert, Rupert's land and the Northwest Territory to Canada on the 15th of July, 1870. The lands comprise present-day Manitoba, most of Saskatchewan, southern Alberta, southern Nunavut, parts of Ontario, and Quebec. If you had HBC ancestors, chances are you also have Métis ancestors. <laughs> So these were originally referred to as mixed ancestry children of Scotsmen and Cree women or Northwest French traders and native women who were born in the Red River settlement. And this is really important because although there are Métis in other parts of Canada, in terms of researching, it's easiest to, if your ancestor was actually in the Red River settlement, because as part of bringing the lands back into the Dominion of Canada, certain records were created and that makes it easier to find them. The 1901 census has a column, column number five, and if you see an R in there, it means that they were red or Indian. The censuses are available at Ancestry. They're also available on the Library and Archives Canada website for free. The Manitoba Act in 1870 gave each Métis family an official certificate saying that they owned a piece of land. The land was granted for the benefit of the families of half-breed residents. And it specified that it would be divided among the children of the half-breed heads of families and then granted to the said children respectively. So I had said that there were documents that were created as part of trying to bring the Red River settlement back in under the Dominion of Canada. And this was really a way to settle the West and to bring the West back in uh, to bring it into the Dominion of Canada. It had never been a part of, it, of Canada. Uh, we had Upper Canada and Lower Canada. We had the Maritimes, and now we wanted to bring the West in. And so this was a way of uh, settling the West and bringing it into the Dominion of Canada. So there was a script commission that was uh, limited to Lake Winnipeg and the Mackenzie River basins. Script was given to Métis heads of household living in Manitoba and parts of the former Northwest Territories. Métis, Métis people living outside of these areas were not awarded script because it was a system concerned with settling the West. There were two ty types of script. There was money script at a dollar an acre, and there was land script, uh, which was for parcels of land. So the land script would be in denominations of 
80 acres, 120 acres, 240 acres. And it was specifically tied to the head of the household. The head of the household was named on the document. So no one else could claim it, could claim the land. Money script, you could trade in your land script for money script, and it was equivalent in a dollar an acre. So instead of getting 80 acres of land, you would be given $80. Instead of getting 120 acres of land, you would be given $120, etc. Métis who cancelled their land script had to swear an affidavit, and you can find those affidavits as well as part of the research. So this affidavit, is an, this is an example, and it says, I, Suzanne Sayers of Bay St. Paul, make oath and say as follows. I am a half-breed head of the family, consisting of my husband and children, and I claim to be entitled to receive a grant of 160 acres of land or receive script for $160. I was born on or about the year 1833 in the parish of St. Francis Xavier. Louis Fleury, a half-breed, was my father, and his wife, Josephine, an Indian woman, was my mother. And then you can see there the affidavit number, the claim number, the script number, and where it was issued. <clears throat> so if you're looking for Métis ancestors in the West, Gail Moran has a ton of books. Uh, I've just picked out four here. These are all available on Amazon. And she has uh, indexed and transcribed the Manitoba script, the 1900 script index, the Red River settlement censuses, and the Northwest half-read script. Personal reading, follow the rev following the river, traces of Red River women. This, uh, her great, third, her great, great grandmother was, um, her great, great grandfather worked for, uh, was an officer for the Hudson's Bay Company, um, and he was at Norway House. Um, her, the, his wife had gone for a weekend to see him, and when the weekend was over, she got on the boat, and as she was coming back down the river, the boat combusted, uh, just blew into flames and so everybody well he watched his wife basically burn alive and so Lori uh, Nielsen glows and to find out more about the story of her great-grandmother. Library and Archives Canada has the red and black series these are records for the Department of Indian Affairs or the Department of the Interior. The series began in 1870 and was kept in a ledger with a red cover thus the red series. The red records cover Manitoba, the Northwest Territories, BC, and the Maritimes. Black series started in 1882 with a black cover to the ledger, and that covered the east. So it split the ledgers into east, which was Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, and west, which was Manitoba, BC, and the Northwest Territories. The Glenbow archives are at the University of Calgary, and they have a raft of records to do with Métis research and also with Red River Settlement research. <clears throat> they have the Al uh, Alberta Métis Association funds. Restricted records, uh, or sensitive records are restricted until 2038 or may be used with written permission. Federation of Métis Settlement funds. They have the Elizabeth Métis Settlement Association Council funds and Métis Settlement 30, which was a, a Métis Settlement 30 kilometers southwest of Grand Centre, Alberta. That's the Elizabeth Métis Settlement. They have baptism extracts, marriage extracts, and burial extracts. They have uh, the Métis Genealogy Researchers Collection, and they have Gail Moran's Genealogical Collection. So Gail Moran's collection consists of a database of 65,434 records of persons who were Métis ancestors. For each individual, the dates, place of birth, baptism, marriage, death, and burial, and notes on sources are given if known. They have the Charles Denny Fonz. He was the um, founder, really, of the uh, Alberta Genealogical Society. There are 41.3 meters of textual records in the Charles Denny Fonz, roughly 3,800 photographs, and they're on 61 microfilm reels. In 1967, he began doing genealogical research on his wife's family, which descended from several of the Lord Selkirk River, Red River settler families. 
The project grew, and by 1885, he had compiled family history files on over 1,200 families with roots in the Red River, predominantly Métis and fur trading families. So you can go in here and find, this is at the um, Glen, Glenbow Archives website, and the Charles Denny Fawns. And if you can see here, if it has um, this square beside it, then there is a, uh, you can go into that and see uh, the digitized copy of the record. So this is, it also has a return showing the amount, this is not part of Charles Denny's Fonz, a uh, return showing the amount of provisions is, is issued to destitute half-breeds by the Office of the Commissioner of the Northwest Mounted Police. The table includes name, number of family, dates, amount of flour and bacon given, provisions were issued at St. Albert, Wolf Creek, uh, Lac St. Anne, Stony Plain, Edmonton, and Fort Saskatchewan. They also have the Louis Riel collection, which consists of scrapbooks, broadsides, um, essay of stamp attributed to the provisional government, Samuel Pluckett's letters and photographs regarding the rebellion. So Louis Riel really um, fought for the rights of the Métis. Uh, they have genealogical data on the Riel family, correspondence regarding his coffin, and published collection of documents regarding his life. This is an excerpt from the scrapbook of James Ross uh, in the Louis Riel collection. The president representatives of the French-speaking population of Rupert's Land and Council, the invaders of our rights now being expelled, already aware of your sympathy, do extend the hand of friendship to your friendly inhabitants, and in doing so, invite you to send 12 representatives from the following places to form one body with the above council consisting of 12 members to consider the present political state of this country and to adopt such me measures as may be deemed best for the future welfare of the same. And then they also have, this is from uh, Louis Riel's personal collection, I have devoted my life to my country. If it is necessary for the happiness of my country that I should now soon cease to live, I leave it to the providence of my God. Glenbo Archives also has a Department of Indian Affairs, uh, the Hobama Indian Agency Fonds, consisting of official diaries, letter register books, lists of Métis who withdrew from treaty, Pigeon Lake annuity pay, invoices, receipts, and record books regarding supplies of beef sales, slaughter, grist and sawmills, daily issue books, cash books, medical reports, correspondence regarding the industrial schools. In addition, the Glenbow Archives has the Canadian Pacific Railway Western Division, uh, the Riel Rebellion Telegram Fonds. The Fonds consist of telegrams received at the CPR's Winnipeg office related to the Re Louis Riel Rebellion. It includes a copy of Crowfoot's Declaration of Loyalty to the Queen. As well, the CPR's telegraph services also provide details, detailed communications regarding troop movements, Métis rebellions, Indians, settlers, weather, and battles in the Northwest. Further reports from, north, from the North. Rebels are gathering at South Branch of the Saskatchewan, sent down the Royal Maid back to Prince Albert. It is feared an action will occur when the police arrive there, which will be on Tuesday. In the 19th century, the military settling department at Quebec, under British orders, assisted new immigrants until it was disbanded in 1822. Assistance was also given under the authority of Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. From 1828, the emigrant agent at Quebec, Alexander Carlisle Buchanan, acted on behalf of Upper Canada in that port. During the heavy immigration of 1831 and 1832, the needs of immigrants took up much of the attention of Crown land agents. The first emigrant office in Upper Canada was opened in 1833 in Toronto. Many immigrants were assisted by the Toronto Immigration Office. These records are available at Archives of Ontario, the fully searchable index, and the, index, the online indexes give you the name, nationality, name of the ship, and year of entry. The records themselves are available on microfilm. 
1815, the government assisted Scottish emigrants to come to Canada and provided them with grants of land in Lanark County, Ontario. The first load of emigrants came from Lochiel on Skye aboard the ship Dorothy. The men were given 100 acres, and each son, upon reaching the age of 21, could also petition for his own grant of 100 acres. Archives Ontario has land warrants for Scottish emigrants, as well as the extracts, which give the name uh, of the ship that they sailed on and the place in Scotland that they departed from. These are available, as I said, at the uh, Archives Ontario. They're not available online. However, you can also get records for a lot of records from uh, the Ontario Archives at Family Search uh, on microfilm, but you need to be in, the in one of the Family Search centers in order to access them. As I said, the applications, warrants, and certificates are available on microfilm in their RG1 collection. In 1792, the Crown purchased enormous tract of land in Upper Canada from a band of nomadic Algonquin-speaking Indians for uh, 1,100 pounds. By 1826, two and a half million acres of the land were sold to the Canada Company for a whopping 2.5 million pounds. Quite an incredible profit, really. The Canada Company was the brainchild of John Galt, a Scottish novelist. Galt had been hired by a group of settlers in the Niagara area who wanted to be compensated for the losses that they'd sustained during the War of 1812. Despite strong connections to the British halls of power, he was not able to pry loose any money, but his efforts gave him the idea for the Canada Company. The Canada Company assisted emigrants by providing good ships, low fares, and provisions of tools as well as inexpensive land the company surveyed and provided massive Huron tract. In the early 1840s, 998 Highland Crofters left South Uist and Bembecula and emigrated to Middlesex County in Ontario, settling on the Huron tract. These settlers were attracted by the prospect of owning land. The land within the Huron Tract comprised some of the richest and most fertile fa farming country in Ontario. The largest group of settlers along the Huron Tract were from Scotland. In 1833, there were about 685 people living on the Huron Tract. Six years later, the number of settlers had risen to 4,800. The earliest township records are for Godrich and Tuckersmith and date to 1835. Land in Gray County was also part of the Huron Tract, and it started being settled in 1852. Records for the Huron Tract can be found on the Library and Archives Canada website. There were a number of colonial societies formed in order to uh, colonize Canada and to keep it British. And although the the, uh, there were a, a number of different companies, uh, different organizations, they all sort of um, followed the same set of rules. And that was that entire families would be brought out together. They had to have able-bodied men or women of good character. They could not exceed a specified age or have families exceeding a specified number of children. The potential emigrants had to possess a specified quantity and description of clothing. So they would be given a list of provisions that they needed and they had to get that for themselves. The families were required to pay a deposit of anywhere from one to two pounds for adults and 10 shillings for children. People exceeding a certain age would pay more. So if they said not uh, exceeding a certain age. So they had to have somebody in the family who was uh, able-bodied and, and between a certain age so that they could work the farm and make some money and pay back the um, colonizing office, colonial office. However, that didn't mean that they couldn't bring their family with them. So they could bring their parents or their in-laws. They just paid more for those people. They had to ensure that they had uh, exhausted every other opportunity to find money. And only after they had proven that would they be able to um, be given money by the colonial companies. The trustees or owners of the properties from which the emigrants departed were expected to pay one third of the sum and they could make application for a grant under the colonial scheme. Any sum advanced to the emigrants had to be repaid. 
With the building of the railroad, land in the West opened up and this set new opportunity for settlement schemes. The British and Canadian government co-sponsored settlement in both Manitoba and Saskatchewan, which attracted settlers from Harris and Lewis. Unlike the settlement grants in the Maritimes, Quebec and Ontario, the grants in the West came fully stocked. While the grants in the East came with uncleared land, the grants in the West were systematically settled. The Canadian Agriculture, Coal and Colonization Company's plans show this quite clearly. The Canada Northwest Land Company provided 11 settlements in the provinces of the Assiniboia, which was now Manitoba, and Alberta. These settlements were 30 miles apart from each other and they extended all along the Canadian Pacific Railway lines at the foot of the Rockies. This essentially encompassed the areas between Brandon, Manitoba, and Regina, Saskatchewan. The 11 settlements comprised of 10,000 acres each, and in the center of each settlement were 680 acres, which was to be set aside, 640 acres, which was to be set aside for the building of a village, including a kirk and a school. Each person who settled agreed to settle on these lands under the following conditions. They must commence residence within six months of arriving in Canada. They had to stay on the land for three years. They could not be absent for more than six months without the permission of the Department of the Interior. Once they had fulfilled their agreement, they could purchase an additional 160 acres of land. The farmer had to pay 100 pounds and the Northwest Company loaned them 192 pounds, which basically covered their provisions for the first year. They came fully equipped, which meant they were fully fenced. There was a farmhouse that was furnished, had stables, barn, cattle, and sheep sheds. <clears throat> and it was also revenue bearing. The idea was that they were to start paying back their money as quickly as possible. They had noticed that in the East, people weren't paying back their money for probably four or five years because it took that length of time to clear the land, to build their house, to sow uh, their grain, and to be able to reap that back in enough harvest to be able to make any money to pay back. So they decided to make it profitable right from the get-go by providing everything that was necessary. Their philosophy was that this prevented the isolation of any one family. Families and neighbors could emigrate together and that would mean that they were surrounded by their kith and kin. This allowed them to carry on their customs, their traditions, their culture and their language. Records for the Canada Northwest Land Company are on deposit with the Glenbow Archives at the University of Calgary. <clears throat> However, it wasn't as successful as the Northwest Land Company had hoped. Uh, and when you see the books of the rent collectors, they would go out to collect the money and they would be told time after time after time that there was no money to be had. The, uh, what they hadn't factored in was the fact that drought hits the west of Canada on an ongoing basis every single year, actually. And so they would manage to uh, sow the grain. The grain was coming along nicely and then drought would hit and <clears throat> basically wipe out their crops. And what the gophers didn't get uh, and that was left over wasn't enough even to feed their own family, never mind to sell and make a profit to start paying back the colonization company. <clears throat> Next, we have the British home children. Between 1869 and the Great Depression, over 100,000 children were sent to Canada from Great Britain. The idea behind the scheme was to alleviate the number of poor and destitute children who were living in workhouses where they were separated from their families. The youngsters were transferred from the workhouses to children's homes and from there they were sent to Canada to work on farms as indentured servants. The girls worked as domestic servants and the boys as farm laborers. <clears throat> Very young children, infants, toddlers and preschoolers were often adopted out to families in Canada while children as young as six were sent to work on the farm. Of the 10,000 children, 7,000 were from Scotland. The first people to pioneer the idea of child migration were Scottish evangelical Christians, Annie McPherson and her sister, Louisa Burt. In 1870, McPherson bought a large workshop, which she turned into a home of industry. Here, the poor and destitute children could, be work, could work, be fed, and educated. McPherson soon became convinced that the real solution for children was to send them to Canada, where they would have more opportunity for a better life. While she was the first, she was not the only person exporting children to farms in Canada. As you can see, there were a number of sending homes from Scotland. 
There is Winwell's uh, Children's Home in Sterling, Couriers at Bridge of Weir. Just a word about Couriers that they are um, very keen to connect descendants of the home children from there with their information on their ancestor. There's the Martha Frew Children's Home in Dunfermline, Aberlour Orphanage, the Glasgow Juvenile Delinquency Board and Girls Industrial School at Mary Hill, and children from there were sent to St. John, New Brunswick. There's the Wellington Reformatory Farm School at Penicook. Some of the boys were sent to Canada and were settled on farms in New Brunswick. Emma Sterling had the children and the Edinburgh and Leith Children's Aid and Refuge Society, and those children were sent to Hillfoot Farm in Aylesford, Nova Scotia. And then you have the Craigie Lynn Boys Farm near Paisley in Scotland. There are extensive records for British Home Children Research. Those can be found freely on the Library and Archives Canada website. Do an ancestor search, put in your ancestor's surname, and the records will come up. There's also extensive records at the British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa, where they have a very extensive database. And for those who went to the uh, Hillfoot Farm at Aylesford, the Genealogy Society of Nova Scotia has a PDF file on those children. That concludes the presentation. I hope it gave you some ideas of where to look for any of your ancestors who left Scotland and came to Canada. Please feel free to connect with me by emailing me at genealogytoursofscotland at gmail.com or tweet me at genealogytours. Thank you again for your time and your attention.